Hello, everyone. Welcome to Badger Talks Live, which brings exciting happenings, resources, and talent from your UW flagship, flagship campus to the people of Wisconsin and beyond. Uh, my name is Brian Ganoyek. I'm originally from Lawrence, Kansas, and I'm working on my doctoral musical uh, arts degree in clarinet performance at the Mead Witter School of Music. I'm currently in my third year and working on my dissertation. Today, we will be getting an insider's view of the Mills Music Library, where I have been an employee for the past two years, uh, from Tom Ka, the Music Public Services Librarian. The library is a treasury of musical resources serving not only the UW-Madison campus community, but also the general public. We have several patrons who come in to look at our collections, um, community memberships. Over the course of its history, the library has grown into a musical research gold mine with more than 250,000 titles, with special collections containing an additional 250,000 items in all formats. As an employee, I get to go back into the cage, which is what we call the secure area where we keep journals, special collections, and record albums. For me, what's amazing to see is the rows and rows of tens of thousands of records back there. With the revival of vinyl over the past decade or so, I see this resource becoming more and more popular. And one of my favorite moments working at the library was talking to a student who had never heard a record album before and hearing how amazing she thought the sound was. I've enjoyed working with and getting to know Tom over the past two years, and he has been a great resource helping me with my, undergrad, uh, with my graduate research. Uh, prior to joining UW-Madison Libraries, Tom was a public public services librarian at uh, Allen Music Library, the University of Hartford, where he served the faculty, staff, and students at the Hart School. So everybody, please welcome Tom Ka. Uh, okay. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. I am coming to you live from the lower level of Memorial Library on the UW-Madison campus, which is where Mills Music Library is located. I'm standing outside the entrance by our new at Mills built bulletin board where we put new arrivals, book jackets, CD covers as they show up. And I'm not gonna let you look at me too much longer because now I'm gonna turn the camera around and we're going to head into <laughs> the library. Let's go. Okay, here we are at the entrance, Mills Music Library, containing Wisconsin Music Archives. All right, we are inside Mills Music Library now. Ever been here or? Right inside, we just talked about, uh, we have a couple of turntables for public use. And we take great joy, we take great joy in teaching people how to use the record players. And we always, I say to people, if you have never listened to a record on a, a turntable before, you may come to Mills Music Library and do something you've never done before in your life. So how many places can you say you can go on any given day and do something you've never done before in your life on this campus? I don't know, but this is one of them. And I'm uh, just showing you right now, uh, I pulled off a record by Alice Coltrane, one of my favorites. And we have headphones people may borrow. And we take, like I said, we take great joy in teaching people how to use turntables. Walking into our reading room, we do have we do have uh, a lot of material that we have taken and scanned and blown up and framed. Here's one of our staff favorites, uh, sheet music by Eileen Long, a woman who wrote the words and music and published it herself in Milwaukee. I don't care about anything anymore. Now, obviously it's a heartbreak song, but we just think it's a wonderful illustration. We have a photo of Lester Polfus, better known as Les Paul, the wizard of Waukesha, Wisconsin. You might've heard of him. Pretty much developed the solid body electric guitar. We have 
blown up images from our TAMS Whitmark collection. I'll be talking more about that later. It's a collection of music theater materials, uh, stage illustrations, costume illustrations from a production of Bizet's Carmen, and then a scan of the copy of the cover of director's score of Carmen. I'll be talking more about TAMS Whitmark, our collection as we go. A brief glimpse of our reference desk, the desk, where we check things out when pandemics aren't happening and answer reference questions. We have a display case right up front where we have currently selected some of the materials that are from our many collections that are being cataloged, described, digitized, and preserved and put online thanks to two grant projects that have been happening here over the past several years. One is called Local Centers Global Sounds, Historic Recordings and Midwestern Musical Vernaculars. And the other is Sustaining Scandinavian Folk Arts in the Upper Midwest. And these are 78, uh, 78 RPM records. These are reel-to-reel -reel tapes, cassettes. We have um, LPs that we are digitizing. My colleague, Nate Gibson, has been instrumental in digitizing many of these items and my colleague Matt Appleby has been cataloging, describing them and putting them into UW Digital Collections for everyone to access freely online. More about that in a bit. Um, oh, can't forget Charles Henry Mills. So Charles Henry Mills is who we are named after. We have, uh, he is our guiding spirit. He was a professor here and director of the School of Music from 1914 to 1937. He was a composer, an organist. He uh, taught here and when he passed away suddenly in 1937, the School of Music faculty at the time decided that they needed to pay tribute to him and they memorialized him by naming the library after him. Now and many years later, they decided to name the concert hall after him. So in the humanities building, there is Mills Hall, Mills Concert Hall. We have a pretty massive print reference collection. A lot of libraries have been downsizing their print reference collections in recent years as more and more things come online. And for music, and especially for the arts and humanities, a lot of times we are hanging on to these materials because it's interesting to trace the development over time of how different subjects get written about historically. So for instance, the New Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, we have this edition, the first edition, we have the second edition in print, which I remember well when it came out in 2001. And that will be the last print edition because it has been online ever since then. And we of course subscribe to the online version, but we hang on to the print. A lot of people find it easy to refer to and you can see the way different entries, the way different composers, different topics get written about differently over time. And Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians goes back to the 19th century with Sir George Grove who decided to put together a definitive dictionary of music and musicians. We have a number of online databases to which we subscribe in which a lot of this material is included, but not everything is online. Believe it, believe it. I'm sure most people, I've had students come in here and ask me, wow, why do you have all these books still here? Why haven't you just put everything online? And of course that, is a complicated answer. It has to do with uh, all sorts of the matters, copyright issues, it has to do with licensing, it has to do with labor to digitize, it has to do with the cost of storing digital files on servers and making them accessible. I could go on and on and on, but I'll stop there. I am known to ramble. We have a staff picks tree. It used to be, it was a piece of furniture that had been designed, kind of makes a little noise. It had been designed to hold headphones back when 
patrons had to come into the library and request headphones to sit in listening carols to listen to recordings. And once that era ended, we still had this piece of furniture trying to decide what to do with it. So we decided to make it a staff picks tree. And so everyone who works here is welcome to make selections from our circulating collections and put a little note in there. We put out books, scores, DVDs, videos, CDs. We still have CDs. We'll, we'll see all the CDs we have. And then this way, patrons, when they come in, they can kind of browse. It's similar to, you know, a bookstore, record store, but it's their library material. So you don't have to go to the cash register and pay for them. More of our reference collection. It's very strange to be talking into a void and have no one responding, but we have lights on sensors. Lights come back on. This, I mentioned my colleague, Nate Gibson, I'm not gonna go into Nate Gibson's workspace, but he is, <laughs> he can hear us, he's in there. <laughs> um, so yeah, Nate is in there working on digitizing sound recordings and that's what he does. Uh, and he does other things as well, but the local centers, global sounds, historic recordings, uh, and uh, Midwestern musical vernaculars, it's a big part of what Nate's doing. Keep working, Nate. All right. Lights on. Just wanted to give everyone a glimpse into our seminar room. Uh, Brian, who introduced me, has had several classes in here. The School of Music holds especially graduate seminar classes in here. We still have the chalkboard, popular with several professors. And I believe we're the only library on campus that has a piano. We have an upright Yamaha. And that gets used occasionally by students, faculty, uh, to play through materials. And we have a full AV tower over there for people to use for teaching and presentations. I wanted to show you this microfiche reader. I don't know how many of you have ever used a microfiche reader, but we still have one and it's kind of hard to see, but right now I put in a piece of microfiche from the State Library of Berlin. That's a manuscript page of Johann Sebastian Bach's Christmas Oratorio. So you can see how sloppy Papa Bach's handwriting, his music notation was. All right, moving on. More of our reading room. Going to do a quick turn in here and make the lights come on. And this is what I dubbed our grant bunker a few years ago once we got the grants to work on the local Centers Global Sounds project. Um, this is where my colleague Matt Appleby does cataloging work and my colleague Katie Campbell works on the Mayrant collection cataloging the Mayrant Collection of Yiddish Recordings. We're gonna talk a little bit more about the Mayrant Collection here in a bit, world's largest collection of Yiddish recordings on 78 RPM records. And the shelves back here are lined with archival materials that have been collected, donated, rounded up from all over the upper Midwest over the past 40 some years mostly by Professor Emeritus of Folklore uh, and Scandinavian Studies, Jim Leary, who is in here still. He retired a couple years back, but he still comes in now and then and helps out. I wish I could see a show of hands. How many of you know what the card catalog is or was? We have the card catalog furniture still here, which is how libraries always used to have their catalogs before everything went online. We have repurposed the furniture to store audio cassettes. And we have several amazing collections, including this modern Indonesian collection, a uh, collection of cassettes from Thailand, from Pakistan, from India, and from the Philippines. We have digitized some of those, not all of those. We get requests now and then. 
Here is a flatbed scanner where my colleague Jack Oldham has been working recently to scan materials, uh, digitize materials. That's a service we offer. You just need to contact us and we can tell you whether or not we can digitize something for you. And in here, this is where we store our compact discs. We still have uh, roughly, I don't know, 35,000, 40,000 CDs. And they still circulate. People may check them out. And they do see some, they get borrowed. And they get used not only by folks on campus, but community members uh, may uh, purchase annual borrowing cards for $40 a year. Wisconsin's, the Wisconsin residents, uh, $40 a year gets you an annual fee card and you may borrow any circulating materials from any of the UW Madison libraries. If you are 62 and over, it's only $20 per year. Now all of that's sort of on hold right now during the pandemic, but there's more information on the website. We also have cabinets full of microfilm, including Billboard, Billboard Magazine, the music industry publication. If you wanted to see what was the top of the charts in September of 1920, we have it on microfilm here. Not all of the Billboard issues have been digitized and put online. And so we still get a lot of people coming to request microfilm and interlibrary loan fills requests from our microfilm. Okay, we have lights on. Give you a glimpse down into the stacks. I'll show you a little bit more in a bit. Just a couple more images of items from our collections on the walls. Gertrude Ma Rainey, uh, an album of 78 RPM records that she made for Paramount Records, a Wisconsin record label, which I'll talk more about in a moment. The Schmidt Sisters Family Orchestra from Mount Calvary, Wisconsin. And the Cordettes from Sheboygan. You might know their hit song, Mr. Sandman. Mr. Sandman, bring me a dream. Jack Pennywell, he designed and created that twin six guitar. It's hard to see in that image, but he is a Wisconsin, uh, a Madison area legend. We have uh, materials, recordings that he made. We have, we just, Got part of a collection we're working on processing. More on Jack Pennywell in the future. So, our stacks. This is where we keep our scores, our books about music, uh, our books on how to write music, how to compose music, how to arrange music. And we have, I don't know how many, we have, you know, over 250,000 items, but we have scores ranging from works for you know, solo instrument to up to 10 or more players. We have symphonic scores. We have, we collect books in all languages, not just English, of course. We have, you know, German, French, Italian, all Asian, Asiatic languages. Back behind here, it's kind of hard to see is the area that Brian mentioned when he introduced me is the cage. And it's just a staff only area. Don't want to go too far back or I'll lose the internet, um, the Wi Fi. So you can see way back in there, that's where we have our LPs and, and our 78 RPM records and a lot of special collections materials. Our Wisconsin Music Archives materials are back there, sheet music books by Wisconsin musicians, composers, and our wall of current periodicals. We still subscribe to print periodicals. We also subscribe to online databases with full text, of course. Most of those subscriptions are available only to UW-Madison faculty, staff, and students on, uh, on campus and remotely. Anyone may come into the library and use and access any of those licensed databases, though, once they're on campus, on the campus internet network, and come in and use the library. Right now, of course, we are only open by appointment, and during this current 
two week period in which Chancellor Blank has said that everyone needs to have online instruction only. The libraries have severely limited our access. So the appointments currently are only available to UW-Madison faculty, staff, and graduate students. Okay, over to some of the materials. Ooh, what's all this? So you heard on Wisconsin at the start of this, and we have, we have a framed scan of on Wisconsin, the cover of the sheet music from 1909 on our wall here, along with two of us from the Badger Band. And we have the actual sheet music right here. We have, I don't know how many hundreds of boxes, archival boxes filled with sheet music in our various sheet music collections. This is from the Wisconsin Sheet Music Collection. A lot of these have been digitized and are available online via UW Digital Collections. On Wisconsin is definitely available online. I mentioned Paramount Records earlier and Paramount Records was one of the labels, one of the labels that was from the confusingly named New York Recording Laboratories, which was part of the Wisconsin Chair Company, which was headquartered in Port Washington, Wisconsin. Nowhere near, nowhere near New York. And from 1917 to 1932, the Wisconsin Chair Company, the New York Recording Laboratories, released a lot of recordings on 78 RPM records on several different labels, Paramount being the label that became the most famous. Uh, there were Broadway, famous and Puritan. And Paramount, within all of the records that they ever released, they had a what was called then a race record series in which they recorded a lot of what became some of the most significant blues recordings ever made. And some of them were made in Chicago, some of them were made in New York, some were made in Richmond, Indiana. But then in 1928, late 1928, they developed, with the help of UW-Madison's engineering department, a recording studio in Grafton, Wisconsin, right near Port Washington, north of Milwaukee, and brought musicians from all over to come record there. And we don't have a lot of those blues records because some of them are so expensive and so rare that they're way out of our price range, but we do have some, including several by Gertrude Ma Rainey, who I talked about earlier. So here's a 78 RPM record of hers on Paramount, Dream Blues on one side and Lost Wondering Blues on the other. And there is the actual album that we scanned to put the image on the wall of. These are two box sets that were released a number of years back. Let's see, I guess five, six years ago um, by Third Man Records and Revenant Records. And we helped out on the first volume, 1917 uh, to 1927, Paramount. Uh, my colleague, Matt Appleby, made some recordings to help the researchers. I helped out with the indexing of this very large book that comes with the box set. We have two copies of each of these. The, the volume two covered 1928 to 1932, and that's when the company went out of business. People may borrow these. Uh, it's pretty impressive. We have two copies and people may borrow them. We have um, Alex Vander Took wrote the definitive history, Paramount's Rise and Fall, the Roots and History of Paramount Records. And he also put out Out of Anonymity, the Paramount and Broadway Territory Bands. He is someone who uh, is from the Netherlands and he's actually come here on several occasions and done research and stayed in touch with us. It's pretty fantastic that we've been able to help help him out. Um, I did mention scores. I did want to quickly just show you uh, as an example. Whoops, did the wrong direction here. As an example of the size variation. So we have Ben Johnston's Quintet for Groups score. That's probably our biggest score. Here is a miniature score, a study score of Mozart's Requiem. 
obviously you wouldn't play from that, but you could study it. You could listen to the recording and study it. And then an example of the sort of chamber music that we have in abundance in our stacks, in our scores. Uh, string Quartet Number 1 by John Harbison, American composer, who has a res summer residency in Token Creek, Wisconsin, and puts on the Token Creek um, Chamber Music Festival and Jazz Festival every year in August. Um, we, we here sew, we have the students sew these parts and put them into these binders to keep them safe. That's another example of the sort of thing we collect. And here are some materials from the Helene Stratman Thomas collection. She was a faculty member in the School of Music and in the 1940s went out across Wisconsin at the request of the American Folklife Center and recorded people telling stories, singing songs from their, what they brought with them when they immigrated to the United States, indigenous populations, and she took copious notes and note cards and transcriptions. And we have all of the paper and all of that. And we have the, this recording device, maybe not, maybe not the one that she actually used, but it's just like a sound scriber that she used to haul around to have people talk into and record. Um, I mentioned Jim Leary earlier. He worked on for years, this book, Folk Songs of Another America, field recordings from the upper Midwest. 1937 to 1946 that was published by University of Wisconsin Press in conjunction with the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress and the Association for Cultural Equity and worked with Dust a Digital record label to put together CDs and a DVD that came with it. All of the audio files that come with this book are now available for free for the public online via our digital collections. We have Folk Songs of Another America uh, digital collection online. Now this is a box that looks pretty nondescript, but it's an archival box containing 78 RPM records that Sherry Mayrent, who I believe is maybe attending this somewhere out there, and Sherry Mayrent amassed the world's largest collection of Yiddish uh, 78 RPM records. And she, came to us years back and donated her collection and set up this Mayrant collection of Yiddish recordings. And we have, I don't even know right now, how many thousands of them available online for free for you to listen to. And the cataloging is ongoing. I mentioned my colleague, Katie Campbell earlier. All of this is overseen, of course, by Jeanette Casey, who is the head of Mills Music Library. And Jeanette has continued to work closely with Sherry over the years as Sherry continues to get more of her collection to us and continue to support the work that we do to share her, her uh, passion, really, with the public. So thank you, Sherry, if you're listening. I think you are. And yeah, so I could go on and on and on, but I realize at this point, I really need to take some questions and maybe I will switch this around and see what is going on. No questions yet, says Fran. Okay. But what is going on in the chat, Fran? You said there are. <laughs> oh, I see. Everybody is just uh, making comments in the chat about what's going on with uh, responding to me. So, all right. Um, <laughs> well then, as I have said before, I can go all day talking about these materials. I will, um, yeah, let's see. Let me turn to the, Folk Songs of Another America. Ba, ba, da, ba, ba. So I mentioned that this is available, uh, the, the audio is available online, and I believe Fran, who is the person who at UW Connects, who reached out to me to do this tour, I believe she might be able to put the link to the 
digital collection of folk songs of another America in the chat, if at all possible. I, I want to say that uh, Jim Leary, he put this together, the book, the hardcover version of this sold out, I believe within a year. And it was kind of his life's work, the culmination of his fixation with the upper Midwest, both Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota and the Upper Peninsula. And he mined the Helene Stratman Thomas collection that we have. Um, oh, and I, I should also mention the Helene Stratman Thomas collection is uh, folded into one of our online digital collections that is the Wisconsin Folk Song Collection 1937 to 1946 that includes what Helene Stratman Thomas did and what a woman named Sidney Robertson Cowell recorded and collected as well. And all of that is available freely online via UW Digital Collections. I, I, don't, know, I don't know if Fran has the links that she's posting in the chat, but I believe people have heard of the Google. And if you use the Google, all of our, uh, all of the things that we have created, all the online collections are findable, discoverable, as we say in the library business, uh, by using Google and keywords will get you there. So the Folk Songs of Another America, this book, I just want to kind of brag on Jim because he's, he's a friend of Mills Music Library, friend of all of us who work here. He really just made the most out of this material and i've heard from people all over who got this and just love it and he ended up getting nominated for a grammy for best album notes which we thought was hilarious because usually you think of notes that come with an album or a recording as just being a couple pages of liner notes and of course this <laughs> this is a 456 page book so he got nominated. He did not win the Grammy. He, uh, he is twice nominated, actually. He was nominated again for the booklet notes that he wrote. I should have grabbed that CD. Oh, well, a, a recording a collection of our 78 RPM records by a label called Helvetia. Uh, Swiss music records on 78 RPM out of Monroe, Wisconsin, that we did in collaboration with a wonderful reissue label, Archeophone Recordings out of Champaign, Illinois. And Jim got a Grammy nomination out of that, those notes as well. Oh, I do have a question. Hey, all right, I better go look. Okay, question. <laughs> Oh yeah, can I can I tell you what it's like embedding these wonderful collections in UW classes from Lisa Carter. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, Lisa Carter is our vice provost, our university librarian. It's been great to incorporate these collections into UW, uh, UW Madison classes. I especially want to uh, wheel around here to talk about uh, Sherry Mayron's collection of Yiddish recordings. There is a course that Professor Pam Potter created years ago um, that's called Yiddish Song and the Jewish Experience. And I have done library instruction sessions for that class for years and years. I've worked here 12 years. And every time I do that class, I get to talk about the Mayron collection and show them the riches that are there and, ex and explain to them it's not just enough of course to uh, study the songs and the, the words and all of that you need to hear it because music of course is a time-based medium and a sound it's sound so <laughs> you need to hear the recordings you need to hear the language you need to hear the instrumentation and to be able to incorporate this amazing collection that we have, thanks to Sherry Mayrant, into that Yiddish song um, and the Jewish experience class is always, it, it's great. It's wonderful, it's enriching to me. The students are kind of blown away that we have all this right here. 
I also have uh, incorporated the Helene Stratman Thomas collection and talked to classes about that and help people do research with that. It's, uh, there's never any shortage of opportunities for me to incorporate what we have into the coursework that the faculty are doing, both in the Mead Witter School of Music and throughout the university. So Pam Potter's class is actually cross-listed in German and Jewish studies. And um, yeah, I'm always happy to, always happy to work on, work with anyone. Okay, let's see, a second question. What is the oldest recording at the library? Oh yeah. Everybody always asks, what is the oldest recording or what is the, uh, what is the most expensive or most valuable? The, uh, I, be I believe the oldest recording we have might be a Berliner gramophone record that is from 1890 or 1892. Um, I might have to, uh, I, I would have to go at Raoul's, uh Nate from his work and his, uh, sound studio. He probably knows that off the top of his head. I'm blanking on the exact date of that recording, but we do have, I don't know how many, probably over 50,000 78 RPM records. Um, and some of those go back to the turn of the beginning of the 20th century. And we do have a handful of cylinder recordings. And actually, Sherry Mayrent ended up acquiring some of the earliest uh, the earliest cylinder recordings of Yiddish language, uh, the, the so-called Lambert cylinders. And we worked with that same record label, Archeophone, to put out a release that incorporated, included those, and it's called Attractive Hebrews. So if you want to find out more about that, just Google Attractive Hebrews and Lambert, L-A-M-B-E-R-T, and you'll find out. Or go to our Mills Music Library homepage, uh, and you will see an image of, of the Lambert cylinders. They're really striking, pink cylinders. Um, yeah, so anyway, there are, yeah, there are so, so many different uh, materials that we have that are online, that are available to the general public uh, through our digital collections primarily. And I'm always happy to field reference questions. I, I get reference questions all the time from people here in Madison, from people all over the state of Wisconsin, from all over the country, and from all over the world. I've been corresponding with a couple of researchers recently, uh, one in England, one, someone from Venezuela wrote to ask about something we have in our collection, and I got it to him and he was thrilled. It's uh, what I do as music public services librarian is serve the public. And, and the question of, well, who is the public? And the public is everyone. So. That's what I do, and I am glad for you all to have joined joined me here in the, the library where I'm alone, except for my colleague Nate. And I gather the time is up. I want to say to you that, uh, yeah. Oh, there's one more question. Oh, from Franny Steiner. How do you care for all of these? Uh, well, different types of materials. Preservation, yeah, preservation is key. We, we, the digitizing of the sound recordings is partly for preservation purposes and also for access. So we have a really wonderful record cleaner, a vacuum powered record cleaner to clean the items, clean the records, and then Nate will transfer them and he has set up for transferring audio tape. As far as the paper goes, we have an incredible preservation department here at UW-Madison Libraries, and um, our colleagues are just down the hall, and we take things to them all the time to uh, get their help in preserving. As I said earlier, when I talked about this uh, John Harbison string quartet, this is actually a method of preserving the materials, is using these pamphlet binders 
and sewing the scores into them so the musicians may play from them and put them on stands and handle them and they will hold up to that repeated use over and over. So we do that a lot. Uh, oh, I have another question. Okay, how long have you been broadcasting your weekly radio show? All right, so we started a weekly radio show on WSUM 91.7 FM, the campus station, uh, back in January of this year. Feels like five years ago now, but it was in January of 2020. Nate Gibson and I uh, doing a show called Circulating Sounds. And so that's only been going on since January. We're taking a pause from that show during this fall semester as we try to just navigate our way through supporting the return to campus and online instruction and all of that. So we're hoping we're gonna be back on the air on WSUM uh, in the spring. So check our website for that, check our social media. We're on Instagram if you wanna follow us, Mills Music Library, and check our website for all these materials. Uh, thank you so much again for being here, there, wherever you are. I, I love to talk about Mills Music <laughs> Library and all of our holdings and our services and to help people. So feel free to find me, Tom Kahn, the only Tom Kahn on the UW-Madison campus. Um, so yeah, next week, Badger Talks Live. Uh, oh, next, Badger Talk next Tuesday at 4.30 p.m. Happy Hour, virtual painting at Memorial Union. You can join in the fun, virtual painting. Okay, thank you so much again, and uh, everybody stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, get in touch if you have questions about Mills Music Library. Thanks a lot.